for taking time. Thank you all for taking um, time away from students, whether it's virtual or a hybrid model. Um, so thank you for your time today. Um, as we begin, if you would just make sure that video is able to stay off, it just helps with sufficient bandwidth. Um, and mute yourself because we're going to utilize that uh, chat box to make sure that we're able to hear um, everyone and everyone's voices will be able to be heard through the chat box. So um, thank you all for joining um, and we're going to get started with just an overview of our agenda today. As we look through today's session, we are going to be really talking about the key elements that make up a virtual learning plan. Um, everything from looking at the educator schedule to finding ways in a virtual space to connect your colleagues, whether that's your paraprofessionals, your general educators, um, or your related service providers. You know, each, each person brings an essential element to the instruction of your students. So we're going to be thinking about how do we connect uh, in this virtual space, and we know that communication is going to be key for that. We're going to explore leveraging your paraprofessionals. We know our paraprofessionals daily bring such um, support for our students. So we're going to talk about some creative ways uh, that we have seen here in Indiana um, and some best practices for leveraging your paraprofessionals during virtual learning and knowing that that may change in 24 hours even the need to go virtual. And then uh, probably at the center stone of a virtual learning plan is making sure that we're finding effective ways to connect with, with our families and with our guardians and caretakers that are supporting in the first time often the instructional uh, role of providing that direct instruction for their students. So these are going to be the key elements that we're going to talk about today. We're going to also put that into short and long-term goals and give you a template because we also know that it's going to take time and you're going to learn as you go strategies that work better. And so we're going to put this in a template to help plan and prepare for that. As we think through that, those follow our objectives. And our objectives really are going to align to two key components, making sure that we're identifying individualized um, virtual learning needs for yourself as the educator. What are your unique needs for your virtual learning plan and your unique students um, within those elements that I just mentioned? And then providing tools and resources that help you get there. So help you start to plan, help you start to think through those structures. Each element of, of the tools that we're going to provide can be provided in that virtual space. So if you're connecting with your paraprofessional virtually, you'll be able to pull up that template and, and review some of these components. So we're going to share those resources today. And as all of our project success resources are, they can be individualized um, and um, adjusted to meet your needs. So feel free to, to utilize those or create something off of, off of the template that we provide. To give you a little background to the project success team and the project as a whole, we are a statewide resource center here in Indiana that is fully funded by the Indiana Department of Education. And our uh, center's responsibilities are to support educators of students with significant intellectual disabilities. So we do that by providing professional development at no cost across a variety of topics um, in a number of formats. Primary, primary format right now is virtual, but um, believe it or not, we used to go into classrooms and do classroom coaching and, and provide on-site PD as well, and we miss those days. Um, so you'll see on this slide just a little overview of how we provide PD, the, the areas that we, we provide ongoing professional development, and some of the frequently covered topics um, and areas that we spend um, a lot of our time in those topics that that we uh, develop tools and resources for um, pretty consistently. So we encourage you uh, to continue to visit our website, and we'll talk about that in just a moment as well. And Project Success is not alone as a resource center. So uh, you'll hear about our resource center, but we are part of a larger uh, network of centers. So. so we're going to give them, there we go. Um, 
we're part of the Indiana Resource Network. So this resource network is a larger group of resource centers, each with their own specialty uh, that are either partially or fully funded by the Indiana Department of Education. So Project Success is fully funded. So you're able to join all of our sessions for free um, and receive the tools and resources for free. Um, and we encourage you, if you look at the top of this slide, you're gonna see a link and Heidi will place it in the chat box for you so you can get to that directly. But this is a link to the Indiana Resource Center. So you can get a description of each center. You can visit their website. You can have a direct contact um, so that you can make sure that you're reaching out if there's something that you need and explore those resources further. Uh, you may also, beyond this link that we're sharing, if you're on the Department of Education's website, you can also, in the search bar, just add an IRN for EARN, Indiana Resource Network, um, and have a direct link to uh, each of the, the overview of the website and each center. So we encourage you to uh, research that um, and learn more about really some really excellent uh, webinars and services that are provided often at no cost to you as an educator and administrator. As we think about the Project Success team, you're going to see several of us in the chat box, or you may hear several of our voices today. I, I wanted to give you just an overview of who we are, um, some quick access to our emails um, so that you can reach out to us. You're going to hear from myself, um, Heidi, and Ashley today, but you'll also see Amy Howie in the chat box um, and on today's webinar, one of our other subject matter experts and our project management team. So Mary Baker Budisa and Christine Krieger are both part of our project management team. Um, and they have recently spent a tremendous amount of time updating our website. So if you have been on the website, you're gonna see a lot of their work right there. And we're gonna take you to that in just a moment so that you can, we'll give you an overview of how that works. And then we're going to do an introduction of each one of the teammates that are speaking today so that you at least have a face with a name today. So Heidi, take it away. Hello, my name is Heidi Brett Baker, and I've been on the Project Success team for um, a little over two years now. Um, before I joined the team, um, I've had a lot of experience, over 30 years experience in the field of special education, um, and my roles ranged anywhere from being um, a classroom teacher to uh, a school administrator um, in the special education um, realm as a director of special ed as well as an assistant superintendent. Then I moved on to higher ed and taught um, teachers preparing to be teachers um, and then uh, continued on um, to be uh, a subject uh, matter expert for PCG. So I've had a lot of experience um, in the K-12 arena as well as the 18 to 21 year old um, students transitioning into post-secondary or into adulthood. Happy to be here today and um, be able to talk with you about the virtual learning plan. Hi everybody, my name is Ashley Quick. Um, I've been a subject matter expert with Public Consulting Group and Project Success for three years now. Before that, I was a special education teacher in the elementary setting for about 10 years. And in between, I took what I call a gap year or two or three, um, where I did some project management work for a textbook publisher. But I, too, am excited to be here with you today. Hi there, and I am Meredith Katie Merck. Um, I am a, have been a member of the Project Success team for five years now. Um, I was a special educator for several years before that and a building level administrator. Um, if you are new to joining Project Success, you know that we, you may not know that we include pictures of our, our families on there. So um, those are my kiddos. I always like to brag on them, um, Carlisle and my son, Lennon. Um, so we always like to include that so that you have a, a little connection to us in that way. As we move forward, I mentioned the website a couple of times, and this is our website link. So Project Success Indiana. Um, the Indiana is important, so make sure that you add its Project Success Indiana um, so that you get a direct link to our website. Um, if you haven't seen our updates, it's going to look slightly differently. So um, typically, we would send you directly to the resources, um, and you would link that way. Today, there's an extra um, 
aspects to our website, and that is the events tab. So we are going to encourage you, Heidi placed it there in the chat box, to visit the events page. There uh, you will see the drop down for the back to school webinar. So we encourage you to visit that. Um, get to know our new website. Uh, Mary and Christine have spent a lot of time organizing that so it's um, easier to access for educators and administrators and easier to get to our distance learning or our virtual learning resources as well. So we encourage you um, to continue to visit that, to explore it. If it's new to you and it looks different than before, please reach out to us if you're looking for a specific resource. We can get that to you and help help guide you to where it is on the website underneath educators or administrators. So um, we think that you'll find it easy to access and easy to find what you need uh, based on the role that you're providing to your students. All right, so we've talked a lot about the chat box. And so this is gonna be your opportunity to for us to start the practice with the, with the chat box. Um, thank you all for introducing yourselves. But we would like to hear some of the successes or the challenges you have had with your school um, or maybe your larger district um, that you've had with virtual learning. So what successes and challenges have your school or your district identified previous with your previous experiences with virtual learning? So things that may have happened when in the spring when school started to close. So if you could just add that and we'll start to kind of look through that. So internet connection, absolutely. I know that that was in different districts in different areas that, that challenges that engagement piece, absolutely. And any successes, parent involvement, excellent. Giving parents a different space to connect is important, especially for those who do prefer that virtual or that text option. Better connection with parents of students that I've worked with virtually, excellent, thank you. For sharing that. We'll give you a couple of minutes and with all of our chat boxes I think it's important. I know it takes a minute to kind of think through and type up your response. We will be monitoring the chat box throughout the, the afternoon here so if you want to continue to share we encourage you to continue to add that. Um, and I should have mentioned earlier, if we don't get to a question immediately, after a couple of minutes, please re-ask it. We've likely, it, it scrolls quickly for us. So um, if we don't get to it, please go ahead and re-ask it and someone from our team will get there. So some of the challenges, some parents started off strong and then fell off the boat. Absolutely a very stressful time for all of us, especially our parents who are in a role that is different than before. Difficulties, um, how to maintain engagement for students with more significant challenges. Excellent, thank you for sharing that. Um, here's a success. All students were provided with online indoor packets throughout the spring. And then one of the challenges were parents being overwhelmed with the expectations. Absolutely. Um, and available and time available to collaborate. Thank you. I encourage you to continue to share in that in the chat box. We're gonna get, go on ahead and go on down and talk about what um, steps are involved in a virtual learning action plan and, and kind of get you teed up for what each one of our team members will be providing today. So as we're talking about uh, the steps of a virtual learning plan, we're gonna be starting with developing an educator schedule and give you some tools and resources to organize um, your time and I'm going to encourage you to um, and give you some tools to do that and then we're going to work on the connecting with families and your colleagues and then move down to some goal setting the taking action steps um, really thinking about developing out some goals for the semester um, that will support your learners so we're going to follow through um, just like this um, scale shows we're going to go step by step we're going to give you tools and resources underneath underneath each section and we're going to start with creating an educator schedule and Ashley's going to walk us through this component um, and give you some tools and resources to start scheduling and collaborating with your colleagues. Okay 
So let's take a look at developing the educator schedule. There's a couple links on this slide here that we'll also discuss in more detail on the upcoming slides, but just wanted to point out that those resources are linked here as well. So the importance of developing a schedule can pretty much be summarized by this quote, a plan is what, a schedule is when, and it takes both a plan and a schedule to get things done. So it's one thing to come up with a plan for what you want to do, but if there's not a timeline, you know, for completing the elements of the plan, those things may never get done at all, especially in these times where it's harder to go off of sort of um, rote memory or what you've always done. These are, these are new times and we're encountering new things and um, we have to have a plan and a schedule for getting everything done. So when you're thinking about how to build, in this case, maybe a weekly schedule, for, an, for you as an educator, there are a variety of things that you'll want to hold space for. Um, a few of them would be meetings with staff. So whether that's professional learning communities that you're involved in, grade level teams, check-ins with your paraprofessionals, uh, collaborating with gen ed teachers or related services pro professionals. Those are all kinds of meetings that you'll want to make sure there's some kind of space held for. Also, time to model academic skills for both families and caretakers and students, especially all of us who are doing this virtually now. Um, it, it's a lot harder to, to be able to do this not in a face-to-face -face way, uh, model academic skills for students. And the families and caretakers are really taking on a lot more of that, that instructional piece. So for you to have time in your schedule to be able to provide that modeling is important. Another element that you want to hold space for is open office hours, whether it's asynchronous or synchronous, so that you can accommodate the questions that come in, these academic questions from the families or the students themselves. And then lastly, you're going to want to make sure that you have time to plan for your plan, your lessons, plan your um, time to grade, time to reflect and research on you know, new platforms or new activities or strategies that you might be wanting to incorporate. And last but not least, and but perhaps certainly most importantly, is to practice self-care in this time. You have to have time and make time, plan to have that time to take care of yourself so that we can get all through, through all of this. Another thing you'll wanna consider is um, how to share and post your schedule so that it's visual and easily accessible to yourself, number one, if it's not out in front of your face, it's, it's harder to access, but also making it accessible to your colleagues, the families that you're working with, and um, the leadership that, that you're working under as well. So knowing the increased number of responsibilities and meetings that everyone will be balancing this year, um, I think it's important to consider how to make meetings as accessible as possible for those who may not be able to attend. So a few things you wanna think about, recording the meeting, just as we're doing here today, we have a recording uh, going now so that people who aren't able to make it at this specific time can access it at another time. Same thing for, for your staff meetings or other kinds of professional development, it's important to record that and then follow up with an email to make sure that everyone has access to that recording. Think about where you'll store that recording so that people can get to it in the future, whether they need to address it or uh, access it again for follow up or refer to it for to answer questions. Think about developing a process for adding to or reviewing the agenda for the different meetings that you'll be having if you're unable to join the meeting live. So how can team members still contribute to the discussions that are happening, even if they're not able to attend the meeting live? And make sure that the input that's coming in from the team is valued. So you might want to create a link to either, either or uh, provide input in some way to um, the conversations that the team is having, whether it is live or whether some of that is happening asynchronously. Something that we'll look at here in a bit is a rolling agenda, which is really useful for trying to keep everyone on the same page, even if you're not always able to be together, meeting together at the same time. Also, when you're thinking specifically about professional development and creating a schedule, um, first you'll wanna figure out and really zone in on what are your professional development needs, how you can make time for that. If you need ideas or if you wanna take a needs assessment, you can contact us. We have a, a playbook that's available upon request. And we've also linked here several resources, um, other kinds of webinars and things that we've done um, and also that, that other resource centers have done throughout the Indiana Resource Network. So, 
those links are live there that you'll be able to click on those and access resources and webinars from other resource centers as well. So that's just a, the, the tip of the iceberg to support you in finding some additional professional development. So here's one of those links that I mentioned at the beginning of this section. There's a template for the educator schedule for virtual learning. So this will really walk you through some of the elements that you need to consider when we're scheduling. Um, what kind of meetings do you need to have? Which ones are mandatory? Which ones are facilitated by administration? Which ones are just sort of um, colleagues getting together to collaborate or discuss? When and how often do you think you'll need to be modeling academic skills like we talked about for both families and students? So this template, which you can reach through the link there, will help you walk through all of that and be very intentional about laying all that out um, in a scheduled way. So let's hear from you now. Um, what are some takeaways that you've heard here just in these few minutes that you might wanna try implementing into your daily schedule? Or what other kinds of supports do you feel like you might need in developing your schedule as we think about moving forward this school year? Remember, you can um, put your answers in the chat box and we will review those there. And again, if it, if it takes you a moment to get your get your thoughts together, that's no worries. We will make sure someone is is keeping an eye on the chat box so that we can include everyone's everyone's thoughts here. What are you thinking about schedules? I know it's hard. That's all, maybe one of the number one things that we hear is just finding the time, right? But I think that the, the whole idea of making a plan ahead of time helps you find little bits of time that you can that you can piece together to make some of this happen where, where it might not otherwise happen. So Elena is sharing creating a plan is important. Thinking it out beforehand will help you prioritize what needs to be accomplished. Absolutely. I'm very much one of the people uh, that is everything is high priority. So everything needs to happen right now because I don't, you know, prioritizing is hard. But when you can write it out in that way, um, it helps you take that, you know, a second to really think through what is most critical to get done and make sure that you have planned time for that. Laying things out initially to get an idea of how doable this will be and then revising the schedule. I think that's really important. You do not have to stick to whatever you come up with on your first go around. Um, use you know, your experiences to, to adjust and to, to take other feedback from, from others into consideration and, and keep refining it to what works best for you. Blocking out time to take care of routine activities that get forgotten when not planned for, yes, that happens all the time. We look at our calendar and think, okay, those are the things we're responsible for, but what about the things we do every day that we don't need to put on our calendar? We may run out of time for those. That's a really good point. These are great points. Creating a shared space for meetings and recordings with access for support staff would be really helpful, absolutely. We need to make sure everyone on the team is, is able to access the information and, and um, stay on the same page. Designating office hours sounds good, yeah. This is all really good feedback. Family check-in in place of student check-in, absolutely. Espec I mean, always families have been important, right? And their feedback and, and their engagement has been important, but I think now more than ever to have families on the same page as us that we can check in with them and make, make sure we're all moving forward is, is important. Keep those thoughts coming there in the chat box. We'll keep addressing those as we go, but I wanna move on for a moment now and just talk about collaboration with colleagues. So again, there are a few links on this slide that we'll talk about in more detail here in a bit. Keisha is sharing it's hard to separate personal and work stuff that need to be on a schedule in one place. I am a color coding queen, Keisha. That's what I. That's where I take uh, color coding to the next level, <laughs> trying to separate those things. That's a really good point, though. So being able to collaborate with colleagues is it's key. It's a key piece of effective um, learning in general for students, but effective virtual learning too, right? That that we're learning and sharing with our colleagues. And it's an important element it, when you're thinking about building this schedule that you make time for it as well. So there are these resources linked here and let's keep moving forward here and talk about some of them. So again, with a quote here to just sort of um, synthesize what we're talking about, I guess, coming together is a beginning, staying together is a process, is progress and working together is success. So we all know 
I mean, we, we could re repeat this in our sleep, right, that collaboration is important, but in order for it to be effective, it also has to be sustained, right? So it's not only that we're coming together, we have to make efforts to stay together and not only stay together, but actually be working in sort of a, a symbiotic way. I love these comments about color coding. <laughs> I found my people here. Um, what type of planner would I recommend? You know what? I'll get back to you on that. I have all sorts of thoughts, but now's not the time. We got to <laughs> we got to talk about schedules. Um, okay, so here's a workflow for determining details to set up smoothly run virtual meetings. First, you're going to determine your virtual platform. Many of you already have some things, some platforms that are available to you. We're utilizing Teams today. Um, school districts have, uh, you know, some districts have Google where they might use Google Meet, but you're going to want to determine that platform right off the bat because those settings and those features can really impact the kinds of um, meetings that you have or what you're able to do in those meetings. Determine the meeting time and length. Um, consider setting the meeting to end maybe five minutes early. So rather than a 30 minute meeting, meeting maybe set it to be 25. That will allow transition time, especially for those of you who may have back-to-back -back meetings often. Determining the focus and the desired outcome. So really making sure that you're using your time wisely by having that focus identified ahead of time and sort of the desired outcome. What are we really trying to get out of this time together? Many times it can sort of turn into a, a catch-up session or a um, almost a problem-solving session, which isn't necessarily bad, but if there's a different desired outcome or a different focus that you're trying to have, it's important for that to be identified ahead of time. Develop an agenda. So not just the focus of here's what I want to talk about, but how are we going to move through that? Um, how are we going to keep ourselves on track? And, and an, an agenda is a really good way to do that. And then thinking about sharing that out ahead of time so that everyone's on the same page during the meeting. And also if they, they can be thinking ahead of time about any thoughts that they might want to be sharing for any of those elements that are present on the agenda. And lastly, developing a process for outstanding agenda items. So what if you don't get through everything? We can't just let you know the unaddressed items kind of float away. Um, we have to be intentional about making sure that all the items are covered. So making sure that you are truly um, thinking about what will we do for the things that, that we don't get to. And that'll be that rolling agenda template that we'll look at here in just a second. First, I just wanna show you this template of, for collaborating with colleagues overall. Again, similar to the other template we looked at, there are some considerations, um, things that I just discussed, but I'm just showing you how that it is it's set up in this template format and how you can sort of set things out for yourself and make notes here. So the, it's accessible in this link. Meredith is putting it there in the chat box as well so that you can download that template and, and use it um, however you see fit to help you really plan to have time to collaborate with colleagues. Here's that rolling agenda template we talked about. So this, the idea for this is that there's just sort of this one single document, it's ongoing or rolling, where you can keep your meeting notes or the action items that you wanna make sure to address. And it helps everyone stay organized, um, helps everyone collaborate when you're all able to access it together. Um, and it helps hold people accountable because all the tasks, all the things are, are right there for everyone to access. And so everyone is aware of, of what everyone is working on. This is also really helpful because it, it prevents important information from being lost in maybe your inbox or, or somewhere. If you know that this is where you go um, for the key information or the key action items, it's always going to be there and accessible in the same way to everyone and not get lost in an inbox. Um, so that's just a really brief sort of overview and intro to some of these templates that will help you develop an educator schedule. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to Meredith now and she will discuss leveraging paraprofessionals in this work. Thank you. Um, as we're thinking back to that original document uh, that had the steps to developing the virtual learning plan, uh, we really want to focus on that connection and collaboration with colleagues, especially that connection with our paraprofessionals during virtual learning. Um, in the classroom, we have the opportunities when we're in person instruction to provide feedback, to model instruction, to make sure that we're having ongoing communication with our paraprofessionals. And in this virtual space, we can still be modeling and we can still be having really great conversations and opportunities for feedback. We just have to do so in a creative way and in the creative space. So as we're thinking about our paraprofessionals, we really want to 
think about how we can leverage our paraprofessionals during this virtual learning in a successful way. So you're going to see the link to all the resources there. We're going to go through those one at a time, um, and we're going to talk about the importance of leveraging our paraprofessionals during virtual instruction. So as, as I stated earlier, we're going to add some questions into the chat box and give you a moment to respond. But I want to hear if you were in virtual learning, if you were in a virtual learning instructional method before in the spring, if you could share if you were able to leverage your paraprofessionals and utilize them for instruction, um, and in what ways did that what ways were you able to, to use your paraprofessionals during this time? Um, and I know there were probably some challenges. So what were those challenges that came up? So in what ways did you do leverage your paraprofessionals during virtual learning? And then what were some of the challenges or some places that you're really wanting to focus on as we move forward? One of the things we're going to talk about today as you're typing is we're going to talk about some different strategies, um, not only what your paraprofessionals, um, some ways to utilize your paraprofessionals, but also ways that you can help support that process as the educator or um, instructional leader um, and, and be able to help support your paraprofessional in doing those actions. So we'll give a couple of minutes for you to type up uh, those responses. and if um, as you're thinking about that, um, we'll continue to give you some other ideas. So set, setting very specific expectations, absolutely. We know that explicit expectations and instruction is not only important for our students, but those that we're working alongside so that everyone's on the same page. Um, small group instruction and Zoom meetings, which work well for most. Some of our paraprofessionals had difficulty with technology. You know, that is something that we've heard um, in several places. And I think that is a piece to make sure as we talk about professional development in just a minute for our paraprofessionals, that is a really important piece to add on to um, supporting our paraprofessionals is that um, making sure that they have that technology uh, training and utilizing the devices that they're going to be instructing students with. All right, I'm going to continue to look here and then we'll continue to share yes. recorded videos in different subject areas. All right, so they were able to provide that um, as well as join daily meetings. Excellent. Utilizing the Zoom platform um, and making sure that that they were able to assist in that way. Um, as well as working with students in small groups. Excellent. Moderators during virtual meetings. Perfect. Excellent. So please continue to share those. Um, we will continue, as I stated earlier, to monitor the chat box. Um, but I want to make sure that we're utilizing our time wisely today. So when we're thinking about effective teacher and paraprofessional relationships, we're thinking about six key elements. Everything from creating that partnership to strong organization, making sure we're leveraging the strengths of our team. Um, and then this has come up several times, making sure we have clear communication. Um, we want to have strong and successful working relationships with our paraprofessionals um, in order to support student achievement. So we need to make sure we have time in the schedule to communicate. And often when we see that there's a strain in a relationship between teachers and paras, it is because there's some form of misunderstanding that hasn't been communicated about. So being able to take that time to share those expectations for the paraprofessional will be really important. I know that providing feedback was something that came up in the chat box as well. So if you're having a problem with communication, making sure that there is a way that we can schedule time to meet um, and take notes and, and really come to a solution and set some goals to help improve the practice that we're working on resolving. So making sure that we're providing that feedback and that training. And then as was stated a couple of times is making sure that those expectations are clear. Um, we do this with our students. We make sure that we have expectations written in several different ways with visuals. Um, so making sure that we think about and break down and scaffold our expectations for our care professionals too. So making sure that if we're teaching, um, 
a small group Zoom meeting around long vowel sounds that we take and break it down um, how that small group should go. So maybe typing up a schedule and going over it with the para ahead of time. Five minutes of review using the curriculum materials and, and displaying those. Ten minutes of a prepared activity, um, maybe an online game, and then ending with a check for understanding. Just really structuring our time um, so that the paraprofessionals know how they're going to utilize their time with their students. One thing that consistently comes up is how do we communicate during virtual instruction? So here are some elements that I really want you to, to think about and reflect upon um, and think about how that could be utilized with your paraprofessionals that you support. So sharing important school information, a really important piece. And sometimes we as the educators, we're able to check our email and we're able to get those updates frequently, but everything from the virtual learning schedule to the individual student schedules that that paraprofessional is supporting, um, as well as those virtual job expectations. If, if it's a para that has worked many years in the, the um, brick and mortar school, our job has changed drastically if we're providing virtual instruction. So being able to help explain what your expectations are in this virtual space and have time to break it down and, and model that. Um, making sure that you're sharing the handbook. Um, this is often something that gets overlooked, but making sure if, if there's probably been some adjustments about virtual instruction for, for our students in the handbook, making sure that our peers are aware of those, those changes, making sure that they're aware of those expectations. And then most importantly, um, for me on this list at least, is supporting opportunities for professional development, um, encouraging our paraprofessionals to join our at no cost opportunities with the Indiana Resource Centers with Project Success. Um, if we learn about upcoming trainings, sharing that with your paraprofessional, encouraging them to listen or join a recorded session. Um, we've even found um, sending articles or videos to a paraprofessional makes a, a large difference. So they really, our paraprofessionals want to learn and they want to have truly put what's best for the school and students first. Um, we just need to be able to provide those things. So sending meaningful links to helpful videos and articles, yeah, you might be surprised at the difference that that can make, um, especially if it's something that can be read or just viewed in a couple of minutes and give them some quick takeaways. Um, for implementing those those new those new skills are important, especially as it talks to virtual learning. So anything that we can get um, in the hands of our paraprofessionals that's quick and easy is really important now. Um, and we know that our paras want to learn and want to continue to have those opportunities. All right, so this is a piece that I promised you earlier, um, and it's it's broken down by paraprofessional task and how you can help support that as the teacher or um, supervisor in that aspect. So what you'll see um, are some key areas that we typically see paraprofessionals engaged in in virtual learning. So for example, I saw this one come through the chat box, making audio recordings of books or text. Um, some of the things that they may need to help support that would be selecting and providing access to the book or the text. Um, that they will need to provide those audio recordings for. Or maybe they're modifying and adopting curriculum resources um, and developing graphic organizers to help support um, virtual instruction um, to meet individual needs. You know, this is an opportunity as the teacher that we could have a few examples, um, give some very specific ways that we might create a Venn diagram um, or whatever it may be individually to that student. So. I encourage you to look through this list. This is a, the next slide also covers this um, and gives some additional examples. And we will continue to, to take ideas and providing those supports. But um, anything from breaking down um, information into smaller sections um, be, as the educator providing that overall lesson structure and ways to break that down. Those are all really important and a little bit can go a long way. Just like I mentioned earlier with the links and, and the articles, um, any way that we can help give specific instructions on how to support in virtual learning um, 
the better our paraprofessionals will respond and be able to support our students. So I encourage you to look at this list um, and continue to think about what does that mean for your individual paraprofessionals. As I mentioned, it is so important to take time to sit down and collaborate um, virtually one-to-one -one with your paraprofessionals or in a small group of your paraeducators. And I also um, find it really meaningful to talk about what the vision and the mission is for your team um, and really stating some goals around this. So what you'll see on this creating a par uh, partnership consensus template, it's for the teacher and the paraprofessional to work on um, together. And what it allows you to do is really think about what our vision is for every student that you're supporting. Um, and then the, the mission for every student. So those action steps that you're gonna take to accomplish your vision. And then dividing that and, and organizing that into short and long-term goals. It, it gives the opportunity for you as the educator to put your ideas and your expectations and to hear really where the paraprofessional is coming from with this. Um, and how they feel like they can support that process and what their vision is, and really coming to a consensus of how to best support students. And ultimately, as the, the leader in the classroom, you're helping lead the way, but it's important to have the paraprofessional have buy-in and support of this process as well. All right, so I'm gonna jump down one more. This is just some tips to support uh, new paraprofessionals. Um, and I'm going to just jump down to some free upcoming opportunities for paraprofessionals and, and give you the opportunity to go back and review this so that you can get the last component of our session together. So if we could just go down to the free webinars, I wanted to highlight um, this for you because these are going to be a great opportunity for to share with your paraprofessionals. I mentioned earlier uh, finding opportunities to share. And this is one of those. These are going to be pre recorded uh, webinars that are going to be short sessions that your paraprofessionals can watch um, and get an overview of the following topics. So, everything for, um, from understanding culture and bias down to classroom management. So, I encourage you, um, you'll find this on our website under the events section. I encourage you to find that and, and share that with your paraprofessionals. And last but not least, we're going to talk a little bit about go more in depth on communication and communication plans with all individuals. All right. All right. So as we move into our next phase of our plan, Mike Meredith said, we're going to talk about communication. Here on this page, we see several links um, to many of the templates or the resources that we've created for you to um, kind of help you in the plan and to um, be specific and to write down those goals and what you would want to accomplish when communicating with parents, paraprofessionals, um, other other teachers, um, anybody who's on your support team when you're helping to work with students. Um, these can all be found on our website as well. One of the great things that we have in Indiana is our um, our resource center for parents, and that it's called InSource. And in InSource, um, their whole vision is that um, they are helping equip families and um, parents to partner with professionals so that we can have positive um, outcomes and help students re um, reach their potential. So this is a great website um, for us in Indiana. It's called InSource. Um, I'm sure I know we have many people on different um, from different states that maybe your state has a parent resource center as well. But for Indiana, ours is called InSource. And here's the website for that. So as we think about um, moving on and, and kind of creating our communication plan, we really want to think about what are some of the things that we need to know? What are some of the things that we need to um, survey families about? And so um, couple of the things that we bring to mind are these six things that we have listed on the slide. One, technology supports. Do they have technology? Do they have access to Wi-Fi? Um, what kind of Wi-Fi do they have? Um, is it only um, for a certain amount of time or um, is it is it poor, poorly um, able to log in and, and really be um, helpful? Uh, we want to think about family circumstances. Is that parent supporting several other children during this time? Are, is that parent or that caregiver um, having to work while they're supporting students during this virtual learning time. 
there's many things that might go into that family circumstance that would be helpful for you to know when you're helping students engage in the process and helping families work through this. Another key thing is oftentimes parents, like we said, are working. And so we need to determine who's the point of contact that's gonna help them, um, our students work through e-learning or virtual learning. And so uh, it's important when you're kind of setting up that communication plan um, that we are addressing who will be the one. Also, another key thing is communication preferences. Do um, the key person, does that person want to be called and have a phone call? Do they want to have a text? Do they want to have email? It's important when you're creating your plan um, for each student to be thinking about what's their best um, preference for communication. So at, as, we, as Ashley just flips the slide, um, these are the things that we have listed on the communication plan. These are some key questions and considerations when you're thinking about the plan. Um, in the communication plan that Meredith has on our uh, chat box there, it gives you some considerations, um, what to ask um, when thinking about the communication plan, and give you some examples about what might be some of the criteria. Anywhere from um, what devices they have, what can a student work independently, or do they need support all the time? Um, and like I said, what kind of communication they might need. As you go to the next slide, this is um, something that might help that is that family support plan. So this is a, a support plan for each individual student. What's their family support plan? And there's, there, once again, there's some good key questions to ask when thinking about what the support needs are for each family. What does a parent hope for that student to accomplish during virtual learning? What are some of the parent's greatest concerns? How can we help um, those parents with those concerns? How can we talk about what our plan is and what we're gonna do um, so that we can help them through this plan. Um, also giving them, when you have this, co this communication with them, giving them what a typical day might look like. What are some things that you can expect to receive on, the on whatever platform or through email or for whatever, whatever way that they've chosen to access the communication? These are all listed in that family support plan. Just as much as it's, it's important to take the time to fill out this family support plan, it's also is important in the next slide that Ashley just put on to, fit, to check in. So once you've created that support plan and you're following that support plan, it's really important so that we can keep our students engaged and keep our families engaged in this virtual learning that we're checking in. So our, let's check in um, and think about how, how is it going? What are some challenges? What could I give you more resources for um, that, to help you? How can I help you um, help your child with the goals that we've set forward? What activities are working? What activities do you still need some more resources for, for some or some support? Do you need some more strategies or um, some help as you're thinking um, through planning what you, what needs to happen for their for their child? So I would encourage you just as much as it's important to create that communication plan and to that family support plan to make sure you set aside time and that schedule that we talked about um, to, to have check-in times as well. So that's gonna lead us into developing a virtual learning action plan. So, so many of the, um, the things that we've talked about today or the templates that we've just shown you kind of roll right into creating that virtual learning action plan. They help, it helps you put it all together. It helps you think about um, each portion of the learning um, plan that needs to be created. Um, it, it, just like many of our templates, we um, typically um, on one side give you some questions to consider, some things to think about, think through when planning. So on our virtual learning plan, there's, there's a couple of sections that we've talked about today and that are in our virtual learning plan. The first being creating a daily education ed, educator schedule. Remember when we talked about, um, at, Meredith talked about that um, planning your schedule, make sure you're leaving time to communicate with all the key persons that help, are helping you um, around that circle of support for those students, whether it be prepared professionals, other gen ed teachers, other teammates. Um, also setting your schedule up so that you can manage when you need to talk to parents individually, when, when you need to do whole group, when you need to actually plan your lesson plans. Think about those things when you're creating your daily schedule. Also, um, another part of this schedule that is not shown here on here, but when you pull up the learning plan is that connection with colleagues. Make sure you're planned for that. How are you gonna connect? What, what platform are you gonna use? 
Um, how often are you going to connect? Are you going to connect daily, weekly, bi-weekly? Also, it's important, like we talked about, that have a daily agenda or have an agenda. Um, when you're talking about connecting with colleagues, make sure that you um, keep track of those agenda notes. And then that rolling agenda comes in, in handy, too, when you, when you didn't get something accomplished during your meeting, to, that you can go back and then finish it the next time. So in that plan, we also want you to be able to create that parent and communication plan that we just uh, I just talked about just a minute ago. Um, so thinking about how you're going to do that, are you going to do that in, uh, individually, making a phone call? Are you going to send out the plan to parents and have them fill it out and communicate back with you? How are you going to um, formulate a communication plan with parents? How will it best meet everybody's needs so that um, the learning for students can be successful? Then also in that plan, we have to think about what ways are we going to um, activate learning? What kind of learning styles need to happen um, in our plan and how, what that's gonna look like? That would, that would happen in um, the next slide, Ashley, when we're talking about um, the virtual learning plan goals, thinking about our goals, um, creating short-term goals and long-term goals um, for virtual learning. Um, so in that in those terms, when you're thinking about short-term goals, um, it could be as simple as setting what what are what's your short-term goal for this week alone. Um, it could be a short-term goal thinking about what um, what schedule will you work with with your paraprofessional. Um, gives you the implementation date. Then it, be specific when you um, are putting out what you need for those supports for that for that paraprofessional or when you are having some sh a short-term goal that you're talking about with another educator who you're doing some co-teaching with. Um, schedule a time with them, what your lesson plan is gonna look like, um, what supports will you need. These are all, all these portions are um, included in that learning plan and I, we would encourage you to use that template that Meredith has included in our chat box. Um, we encourage you to, to utilize those to help create your learning plan. Um, I know that's a, a oh, lot. I, I, <laughs> Go ahead, Mary. I say I know that's a lot, but we certainly have all these templates listed on our website, and we put them in the chat box. And we certainly would answer questions um, anytime. And I think Mary is going to go onto that and let you know about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we encourage you to pull up that virtual learning plan template and the plan goals, and and really think through and pull all these elements together, because we know it's a working a working progress, and we know that your instructional method is is changing quickly and may even change. Um, oftentimes, that what we're seeing is uh, 24 hours, where we're going from one instructional method to the next. So, having a, a virtual learning plan available and organized is a really important piece, even if you're in a hybrid or an in-person model. Um, in case we, your district or your school needs to go to a virtual learning option. So as we move forward, we're going to open up the chat box again um, with just three guiding questions and give some time for you to ask additional questions too. So we want you to reflect on your next steps following today's webinar and, and really thinking about, is there a specific tool or resource that stood out to you or an area? that you really want to make a goal as you're moving forward. Um, and then what additional information do you need to be successful? Um, I know that's a loaded question, but um, are there specific areas? So if it's family and parent communication um, or working with your parent professional that we can be responsive to, that would be extremely helpful. And then as the last question indicates, what questions might you have for us? So Con Conrad stated, um, thinking about how to incorporate family communication, absolutely, especially during those fall IEP meetings, absolutely. Um, making sure that there's a video to train Paris um, on technology. I can't, um, that came up as a concern several times in the spring, um, and, and each one of you, several of you brought that up today as well. Making sure that our Paris have the opportunity to attend any tech meetings, any trainings that you have, either in person or if you can provide that information um, will be so helpful. So I encourage and I like that that is a goal, um, starting, with, starting with the videos and supporting your paraprofessionals in that way, if a larger PD isn't available to them. 
Um, I also want to leave you with the evaluation. So you can always, as you're continuing to answer these questions, if you would take a moment to uh, fill out our evaluation, um, Ashley has a link there um, on the screen, and we'll also drop it down into the chat box so that you can fill that out. Um, and please continue to reflect on those questions and share those in the chat box as you fill out that evaluation. Um, or if there's a question that you have beyond the, the structure of those three questions, please make sure you ask that and we'll monitor that as we move forward. If you have any questions, you can find our information on our website. So there's an about us section of the website that has all of our emails um, and a way to contact us directly if there's certain questions that you have. We appreciate your time today as you're filling out your um, evaluation, as you're reflecting on those responses. We'll continue to remain in the chat box to answer any questions, but we thank you for your time. Um, if the, you need any support with any of those resources, please reach out to us. We would be happy to support. Thank you. We'll hang on here for just a few minutes if there are other questions and we'll uh, be reading the chat box and responding that way as well. Okay, we're approaching 4.30. Thank you again for joining. If you haven't already, um, select that link for the evaluation and fill that out. Um, if, if you would like to hang on and continue to ask questions in the chat box, uh, we will be here. Um, if not, thank you all for your time um, and continue to know, let us know how to support you um, and make sure you fill out our evaluation and we will See everyone again. We'll meet again. For those of you who are from Indiana, we're going to cover the content connectors on August 26th. So those of you who are local, please join us then. Um, and thank you everyone for joining.